Hello? Okay. If everybody takes their seat, we can make a start, please. Please take a seat. Okay, uh, in this session, uh, we have <coughs> four Takaful and Ritakaful veterans. This is moderated by Tuanaji Tirmizi Nurdin. I think he started his life as an underwriter with uh, Bank Islam Takaful on those early 1982 days. And he's still an underwriter, I think. In in in, uh, in his heart, and he on his panel has uh, Mahesh Mistri, who is the leading, the careful analyst for AMBEST, the ratings agency, one of the leading the careful analysts. And we have Safta Jafar, who is from Millimans, who of course uh, looks uh, at a lot of the careful companies from his actuarial practice. And then we have Omar Guda, who takes care of the Kaful in Africa uh, as a beacon of the Kaful in Africa. So for me, I invite the panelists and hand over to Tuanaji uh, Tirmizi. Thank you, Brother Iqbal. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum wa Good afternoon, everyone. Okay, uh, we have come to session three, challenges of the Takaful and Ritakaful. Okay, we have the three panelists, or experts. All right, um, before I go on, um, let me just say uh, in the program uh, that I represent BIMB Holdings. So, uh, just to tell you who this company is, uh, BME Holdings actually is a financial investment company. We own the oldest Islamic bank in Malaysia. Uh, was established in 1983, and we also own the oldest Takaful company in Malaysia, Sharikat Takaful Malaysia, which was established in 1985. So I now sit on the board of these two companies, uh, uh, of the holding company that owns these two companies, okay? That's just to give you uh, a bit of background in case you're wondering who is this BIME Holdings. Um, looking at the panel, uh, we have uh, uh, none from Malaysia. None, not except for me, because I'm uh, the moderator, so I'm not supposed to speak. Uh, that doesn't mean that in Malaysia we have no challenges. Okay. Uh, every time I come to International Takaful Summit in London, everybody will speak glowingly about Takaful in Malaysia. I'll say thank you very much, very kind of you, and all that. Actually, there are many challenges as well, uh, which uh, if you buy me coffee, I will explain. But being a very uh, 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 dedicated Malaysian. I will not speak badly of my country, okay? But there are many challenges. For example, um, this morning uh, when uh, Brother Iqbal spoke about, he, he mentioned Malaysia, it used to be uh, rural, more rural than urban. Now it's 75% urban and 25% uh, rural. And there are many challenges, and because of this, there's a need for takaful, etc., etc., etc. That's the theory. The reality is, at least in Malaysia, um, the rural, uh, there's a term in Malaysia we call kampung, which is village, eh? kampung. So there's a saying, we say, you can take the guy out of the kampung, but you cannot take the kampung out of the guy. 
this is a problem in Malaysia now. They, they are urban, but they still have the mentality of the rural. So it's a real challenge to promote Takaful when they still have the kampung mentality. Um, but despite that, we've done quite well. Malaysia, of course, uh, it's not all bad. Uh, but you have to see it in a perspective first. Eh? Uh, just speak about Malaysia first. Uh, okay. um, it's a small country, actually, Malaysia. 30 million, 30 million population. Okay. And only 60% Muslims. So that's like 18 million. I think there are more Muslims in Mumbai than in Malaysia, the whole of Malaysia. You know, so uh, more Muslims in China than in Malaysia. <laughs> okay? So despite of that, we, we've done quite well. So we hope that uh, countries with more Muslim population should do better than Malaysia. It's a challenge. challenge I challenge Pakistan. I challenge uh, Indonesia. You should do better than Malaysia. Okay? So despite that, but there are many challenges which I'm not here to speak about. Um, okay, and then uh, Iqbal did speak about investment link being a, uh, oh, we do well in uh, family takaful and investment link is supposed to be the good ones uh, if you buy me coffee I will explain to you there's a sinister reason for that why they go for investment link it is not as rosy as you might think anyway, let's get back to the uh, topic of the day Okay, uh, Safdar will be speaking on the challenges and opportunities for Takaful in the GCC. And then uh, Mahesh will be speaking on the pertinent observation on the Takaful market. So I, sp I hope you will say something about Malaysia. Okay, in your speech, a little bit also okay. And then uh, Omar Gauda will be speaking on the enabling of Takaful in Africa. So, uh, I give uh, each of you speakers uh, 15 minutes, is that okay? And then we will open for question. So, without further ado, uh, let me invite Brother Sabda Jaffa to the restaurant. Uh, thank you very much. Um, as far as Malaysia is concerned, although this is not uh, in my topic right now, uh, suffice to say that uh, as a practitioner, I, I have always admired Malaysia because uh, in Malaysia, the, the, when the vision of Takaful was set up, uh, it was a holistic vision. Uh, the, the capital markets, the money markets, the banking sector, uh, and the insurance sector, Takaful, uh, was looked into from a broader perspective, and, and there was an integration and a clear philosophy of getting a penetration within the Takaful space, and they all move together because you know it's it's all intertwined. Uh, you, you need asset management to to ensure the liabilities of Takaful. Take. Whereas as far as the Gulf is concerned, coming to the Gulf, uh, being open about uh, my perspective as a practitioner, it has been more haphazard, haphazard in the sense in the sense that insurance penetration is very very low in the Gulf almost 0% as far as family Takaful is concerned uh, in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, which is the largest of the, of the lot. Uh, and uh, because, probably because insurance penetration is so low, uh, the policy makers, when they brought in the macroeconomic framework, focus more on the uh, capital markets and the banking, and Islamic banking itself is, is robust. But when it comes to uh, Insurance of Takaful, uh, it's, it's still seen to be very tiny and you still have to fight for that space to be recognized. So there is a disparity between the macroeconomic vision uh, of what we see in Malaysia and the role of uh, Bank Negara in particular in evolving and developing and maturing Takaful over time compared to what we see in the GCC and the numbers will speak for itself and I'm sure Mahesh also will allude to some of that. So what I thought for today's presentation is to, um, if we can have the slides um, working. Yeah, thanks. thanks. So what I thought is we'll spend a little time on, on the UAE market and the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia because these are the two dominant markets as far as the Takaful space is concerned in the Gulf and globally as well based on our 
report in 2017, which we had presented here, Millennium Report on the Kaful family and in and, and, and general, uh, you're talking of a market of 15 to 20 billion in terms of premiums or contributions, of which 11 and a half billion come from um, the Middle East. And, and, and uh, so almost 75% of the global Takaful premiums come from the GCC. Uh, again, it's very small. 15 billion is, is a drop in, in the ocean of what we see out there from an insurance perspective. And of that, the bulk of it, the majority of that uh, uh, 11 billion effectively, 10 billion Saudi Arabia, 1 billion United Arab Emirates, you're talking of, um, uh, it's, it's between the two. It's just half a billion for the rest of the smaller countries, Oman, Bahrain, Kuwait, uh, and, and the others uh, in the wider MENA region. So in terms of understanding the issues of Takaful, these two countries dominate the space. So let's look at UAE. Now, contrary to Many presentations in the past where I've stood here and I've discussed the results and we talked about pessimism as far as Takaful is concerned. It's been an interesting past few good years for Takaful companies in the United Arab Emirates. Talking of nine out of 30 listed companies, they're all 60 companies, others are branches not listed. With about 30, nine of the 30 listed companies, um, uh, the, the total premium accounted to 17% as of 31st December 2018. And you can see overall there has been a premium decline, a slight decline across the board. But when it comes to Takaful, there's been a slight growth uh, relative to the conventional market. So you know, although small, Takaful has, at the, on the top line basis, performed slightly better than the rest of the market. Uh, profitability. Profitability, interestingly, this is United Arab Emirates and this is the Takaful net profit over the years. You can clearly see uh, from, an, uh, uh, you know, when where I spoke here last, uh, last year when we didn't have the results for 17, you know, it, it was a negative and you can see a plus there. So as far as profitability is concerned, we can now see Takaful companies in the United Arab Emirates making profits. Um, the question is, what's changed? Uh, and this is debatable. And then the reality, the way we see it as analysts and practitioners is it is a gift given to the industry by the regulators. Uh, two regulators in particular, the health regulator, because Dubai Health Authority mandated uh, the, the requirement for compulsory health that boosted the market significantly. And the other is that the insurance authority, the regulator in UAE, brought about motor tariffs where, where effectively there was a rate increase there were minimum rates set up, and the market was pricing below the minimum. And with the man mandate from the uh, authority, uh, premium showed up, and, and everybody made money, and well, Takaful companies made money as well. So the underlying fundamental question is, is it the uh, underwriting strength that has led to this, or is it just the fact that they were lucky? Uh, these are things that we need to ask questions uh, about, and I'm sure, again, my colleagues will allude to some of that later on. Um, again, coming to shareholders' equity for Takaful companies, again, you can see uh, uh, if it has been overall stable. Uh, but having said that, there is quite a bit of uh, uh, merger, uh, mergers and acquisition opportunities coming up. Uh, you know, uh, uh, the market has seen quite a few uh, potentials out there. Nothing has manifested yet. And there are many reasons for that, and I won't go into that. Suffice to say that companies are looking for investors. Companies want to consolidate. There is a capital requirement from the uh, authorities uh, in the United Arab Emirates in strengthening solvency. Uh, and for the careful players, it is now a question of survival to ensure that they meet the solvency capital requirements. Uh, uh, it's a risk-based approach. So, so this is where uh, there's a lot of discussion going on, both in Saudi Arabia and in UAE. Uh, we certainly be, have been part of some of that, but we haven't yet seen any manifestation of that uh, 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 at the moment. Uh, these are the key ratios. These are all public listed companies, so we have that published, uh, and you can clearly see uh, the companies in the United Arab Emirates. Orient uh, UNB is a new company, so you cannot uh, put that, uh, uh, you cannot compare that uh, with the rest of the market. But again, you can see pretty decent uh, uh, re uh, return on average equities, the liability equity ratios, and the investment return. So it, it's, it looks respectable as far as 2018 is concerned. Um, 
as far as retention ratios are concerned, and this is again where the rating agencies will be more interested in, in looking at that, and you know, you, you, would, you would want to see an increase in retention. If you have more confidence in your business, you want to keep more, but clearly it's going down actually, significantly down on aggregate basis from 68% overall to 52%. Uh, and again, you know, there are questions as to why that's happening, whether this is coming through as a result of reinsurers coming in to support uh, in financing the solvency requirements of some of the smaller companies who have grown uh, because of the, the growth in motor and medical portfolio. They cannot retain that and are passing on the risks uh, to the reinsurers uh, is, is, is probably one of the reasons that is leading to that. And again, net combined ratios also look Pretty respectable. So that's 2018 as far as UAE is concerned. Uh, let's move on to the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia now. As far as Saudi Arabia is concerned, um, as I mentioned to you, uh, uh, sorry, as I mentioned earlier, that the kingdom we are considering by default that the entire kingdom, the entire insurance industry in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia is takaful, or is it, it's a cooperative model. But we are not here to debate, and I'm not a Sharia scholar to debate whether the cooperative model is part of uh, the takaful or not. But suffice to say that based on what the practitioners typically do when they put numbers together, the, the kingdom is considered as Sharia uh, compliant. Uh, so this is a reflection of the entire insurance stroke takaful, stroke cooperative uh, uh, premiums uh, across. We're talking of 35 billion rials, which is around 10 billion um, US dollars. Uh, in 2018, but you can see a decline actually. The growth has been pretty stagnant over the past uh, three years, uh, and there are again many reasons that that's happening. Uh, and, and one interesting part of the observation really is the family takaful constitutes less than 5% of the total. So it's again almost 0% penetration. Um, uh, yeah. Uh, as far as profitability is concerned, again, it's it's on a decline. So talking of a good 2016 followed by a 2018 where effectively on an aggregate basis the industry has just about been profitable. Uh, now bear in mind the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia again has more than 30 companies. Uh, it is overcrowded. The, there's a strong regulator out there uh, and there are many other challenges in the market we'll probably talk about very shortly. One of them being that the, the customers, the policyholders' reasonable expectation is something the regulators are pushing very hard. And the, because the market is not very mature, uh, there are challenges, and as a result of which customers do complain uh, in the kingdom, the, the, the authorities faced significant challenges when it came to the motorists who are complaining about significant increase in their premiums back in 2015, 16, where again, you can see profitability was great, premiums were high, and the regulator insisted that the premiums should reflect the risk, the underlying risk of each company and the motorists. Why should a reckless driver uh, pay a lower premium than, than somebody who is more careful in driving just because your data systems cannot capture no claims discount and you can't provide no claims discount in your pricing because technically you don't have the strength to do so. So that is where the regulator put a very tough stance and said, we don't care, you sort out your interest, uh, IT requirements, we don't want to see our customers or the, or the customers suffering out there. That led to a lot of tension in the industry and the actuaries were also pushed very hard to come up with pricing and, uh, uh, and uh, in an environment where you don't have the data to come up with no claims discount. But they had to, they were forced to, and you can see probably some of that is reflected in reduction in motor premium, which again has resulted in a lower bottom line for the market. And that's one of the issues out there. And again, you can see in the kingdom, sorry, this slide is, uh, is overcrowded. You're talking of 30 plus companies. Uh, and uh, you know the top three companies, Bhupat, Audi, Al Raji, effectively have more than 55% of the total gross return premium. And if you look at the top 10 companies, it's almost 80% of the market. The rest of the market has extremely small shares. Uh, uh, of, uh, of the top line. So again, it's a market that is overcrowded, there is discussion of, uh, of consolidation, but again, we haven't seen anything fundamental coming out there, but, the, but, but it, it's clearly, uh, it needs to move in that direction. Sama now has required risk-based supervision, which means you need stronger capital. If you need stronger capital, then how do you, uh, how do you cost for capital in your pricing, which is another challenge. So I'll, I'll probably now, time is of essence, so I'll probably you know, try and 
uh, go faster than than, than uh, so overall insight. So putting it all together, as far as uh, opportunities are concerned, it's still an underpenetrated market. So there are opportunities of growth. It's the motor and mandatory medical business that is pushing the penetration up, and, and as a result of which the results that you see effectively reflect these two lines. Of course, there are many other lines which is heavily reinsured. Um, so these are the two lines that will continue to facilitate growth, and significant growth is potentially expected as both the United Arab Emirates and Saudi Arabia is now looking into reforming their health uh, proposition, the, the public health system may be privatized, or the public health system might enter into a partnership with the private uh, insurance entities, and that could result in a huge boost, potentially a huge boost on the, on the medical side, but whether the market is ready for that, whether it's going to happen overnight, or whether that will be phased over, over the years is, is something uh, that uh, we, we need to watch the space. Um, the opportunity for family to come full and retirement remains there. The, Good companies, the solid companies out there, they're still writing good quality. Life business are still writing there, but they're very few in numbers. And as far as Saudi Arabia is concerned, you know, again, they're very, very small in numbers. Uh, regulation, undoubtedly, the regulation has helped to where we are today, uh, you know, and, and the market governance is, is, is potentially uh, being questioned. So this is where the regulator is, is pushing companies to make sure. Uh, opportunity to consolidation, I mentioned that. The presence of global retakaful players has certainly helped. Um, the sad part of the story is that the local regulators are effectively wiped out. There is no credible local reinsurance company in the Middle East at the moment. Many have gone through acquisitions. Some of them have stopped writing new business. I'm talking of the local retakaful players in, in the GCC. Uh, but of course, when it comes to the global retakaful players, some of whom are in this room, they continue to thrive and continue to support the local players out there. Um, and the fact that both Saudi Arabia and UAE is looking to alternative uh, economic, um, uh, alternative economy beyond the oil and, and gas industry is, is pushing some of that. Interestingly, there have been some innovation around insure tech, which, which I think is, is commendable, and I'll probably close with that in the slide after the challenges. Challenges, I think implicitly I've mentioned many, intense competition, just too many players in the market. Uh, there is lack of unique value proposition. It's the same bandwagon, motor and medical. Every Takaful company sells motor and medical. That's the easy way out. That's the easy way to make money. Where is the uniqueness of Takaful in that? Why should I buy a medical and motor policy from a Takaful company compared to a conventional company? What is my added value other than probably Sharia compliance on the investment side? But there's not much investment comes to cash flow management. Health is cash flow management, cash in, cash out. So these are questions that come up, and there hasn't been a, a deep thought around that unique value proposition as such uh, in the market. Um, uh, lack of long-term view profitability. Uh, you know, a lot of the business is, is general insurance because people are generally short-sighted in the market in terms of quick money, let's get the returns and move on. That long-term, that far-sightedness of family takaful is there, but it's limited. And again, investors need to be educated. So there's a, there's a challenge around talent and education. Uh, it's a low interest rate environment uh, in terms of perpetual cost of a car. I don't have time to talk about it, but it, it seems to be improving where you know you have operators charging very high wakala fees, resulting in karat that keeps on moving. The regulators have stepped in. Now they have a three-year period where they need to uh, effectively uh, uh, wipe out the, the karat al hassan or ensure that uh, that is fine. And so, so those those things are taken care of by the regulators. Uh, there is still heavy dependence on retakaful capacity uh, from the local players. There is still lack of confidence that we can write our own business. So these are some of the challenges that we have out there. Uh, in terms of latest developments, uh, IFRS is changing, changing the landscape altogether. All the regulators, uh, the insurance authority in Abu Dhabi, uh, the Qatar Central Bank, uh, SAMA, as well as CMA have all uh, put requirements for takaful and non-takaful entities to ensure that they are compliant and gap analysis and, and the design and implementation phase is put in place so they are up to speed with what's happening in Europe, which is, which is positive on one side, but on the other side, uh, the challenges that the takaful industry faces are phenomenal because they need to adapt to IFRS 17. This is a complete revamp of how your PNL will look like. What is the impact of takaful companies in terms of the hybrid 
model? How will that all look like in a PNL? I don't know. You know, these are areas where serious thought needs to be developed to ensure that companies are are, are meeting the expectations of of this game changer in, in the years to come. And last but not least is telematics. Telematics is taking pace, is picking up. Uh, it's interesting that now some, there are some companies who look at certain fleets and working on telematics and coming up with risk-based premiums. Uh, in fact, the regulator in, in, Abu, uh, in Abu Dhabi is looking at pay-as-you-go models right now, and, and you never know there could be a pilot on that, probably one of the first in the region. Uh, so there is some innovation happening at the same time. Um, and, and lastly, health, as I mentioned to you, there is a major transformation on health which could have a huge impact uh, where uh, companies that write health business may have an opportunity to grab the market of the public sector. Uh, how will that all transform? What will be the role of the careful players in that? We don't know, but if there is excellence out there, if the careful companies can, uh, uh, can provide the capacity to take on that risk uh, in partnership with the careful players, I feel there is a solid opportunity on the health front, because obviously in UK it's all NHS, it's public health, so you know there's not much scope for private sector, but over there it's all private, it's mandatory, and even the public is moving in that direction. So the opportunities are significant for those who have the relevant expertise uh, on that front. I think with that I'll, I'll stop. Thank you. Thank you. Right, good afternoon, and it's a pleasure to be speaking here today at the International Takaful Summit. I'll try not to repeat what Safdar has said, because some of my slides do border on what's already been mentioned. But judging by what I've heard here today and previous conferences, sometimes we're trying to make the kafal and Rita kafal as that perfect model. And I'm not sure if that perfect model really exists today. There are good models, there are companies that are doing well, there are companies, operators that are doing badly, but to get that perfect model, so even if a company is making money, we want them to generate surpluses, we want them to distribute them to the policyholders. And I think in the discussions, it's apparent that we want companies not just to make money, but we want them to do it in the right way, in the right manner, so that is Sharia compliant and they tick all the boxes. And this is what I feel, you know, the aim of a lot of these conferences is trying to get what is that vision of that perfect company in place. So what I'm going to talk about today, I'm not going to go into detail like previous years. years. I'm going to give a high-level snapshot in terms of what the issues are and then what some of the emerging risks, what we are looking at um, as a rating agency just globally. And obviously that is applicable to the Takaful and re Takaful market as well. This is just disclaimers, we can skip over those. Now the data within these charts is based on AMBEST data, so it may not exactly uh, match what some of the companies are reporting due to the way we uh, manipulate and use the data. So initially, I wanted to just say, as a refresh, what are the main issues that are happening in the market? And I'm sure we've seen all of these before, that the market is growing substantially, the Takaful market, the regulatory frame frameworks, particularly in the GCC and the wider Middle East, are continuing to be enhanced and developed, which is good. Um, as mentioned this morning, we're still not reaching the heights of Sharia banking. I think there's a lot of catching up to do. And there's the a very big difference in the dynamic between, say, some of the Asian markets, particularly Malaysia uh, and the Middle East, Middle East markets. And we don't really talk a lot about the African markets as well. There's a lot of new takaful setups in Africa. And maybe it's an unprecedented boon, but I believe some of those companies are doing very well um, in the market. We've mentioned before the reduction in the re uh, capacity on offer. There are more takaful companies generating surpluses. We still have concerns about the alignments of interests between the policyholders and the shareholders, as illustrated in the uh, previous session. Um, one of the most 